How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here, and welcome back to another legendary speedrun of Pokemon Fire and Leaf Green. Today, I've got one of my favorites actually, and then again, I just think about everything from the Hoenn region as my favorite, and that's Groudon. A pure ground type with the ability Drought, boosting the power of fire type moves and decreasing water definitely helps with two of our weaknesses here. But not resisting fire means that we'll be taking increased damage from those attacks in later battles against Blaine and Arrival. Starting out with his moveset though, we get both Mudshot and Scary Face starting out at level 5. Not bad at all. The only thing is is that we can't deal with any sort of flying types or anything with Levitate until level 15 when we learn Ancient Power. And from there, moves like Bulk Up at level 30, Earthquake at level 35, and Fire Blast at level 45 will definitely bring me to victory. Groudon also gets a really sick line of TMs such as Flamethrower, Thunderbolt, Aerial Ace, for those pesky grass types of course, and so on. I actually like the idea of Aerial Ace over a fire type move since Bulk Up is going to be my primary way of setting up stat boosts throughout the entire run, so we'll see how this goes. Anyway, don't forget to like this video and subscribe since three fourths of my viewers are not subscribed, and let's get down to business. So, because of my hard weakness to water and grass, I had to make the decision to give my rival either Squirtle or Bulbasaur. Either give him Squirtle and all of his water attacks are diminished, but he gets something like Executor to annoy me in his party, or I give him Bulbasaur and he gets Gyarados, a water flying type that can't be hit with my ground type moves. Well, I decided on Squirtle since I think Executor is going to be more difficult to deal with later on in the game. After all, we gotta make this difficult for ourselves. But this first battle is no different than most, just spam your only attack move to win, and since they have no type advantage, and we have superior base stats, so that's just all that she wrote. And from here, all I had to do was KO everything I accidentally or purposely ran into with Mudshot, avoid Pidgeys, and get to Pewter City without much irritation. I fought the junior trainer inside of the gym to test my abilities, and got just shy of level 10 before facing off against Brock. I figured I'd have enough firepower behind me with Mudshot, and since I still had 5 power points remaining, I didn't want to waste the time going to the center both before and after the fight. He leads with Geodude, so I went for Mudshot, doing over half as he goes for a defense curl. Mudshot misses surprisingly as he lands a tackle, but he's unable to have a follow-up as a KO, leaving just Onyx. I only have two power points left, so it's either a KO or bust with two attacks. And sure enough, the first Mudshot on it is a critical, lowering his speed and making it an easy task to hit one last one for the KO and the win. Awesome. And now we have the TM for Rock Tomb as well, which Groudon can learn, so there's an actual point in using it. Also, funny enough, I actually didn't forget to grab Repels before getting the running shoes and heading out into Route 3. I usually do, but the times I don't, that means I'm actually trying. None of the trainers could really stand up to a strong ground or rock type attack at this point, so it was easy pickings until I hit the grass, caught a Spearow for my in-game trade later on, and ran into Mount Moon. I even remembered how to get the rare candy without fighting optional trainers. That's how much I'm trying this time. Hmm. Maybe it's a bad thing I'm sharing the fact that I'm not trying most of the time until a battle annoys me enough. Oh well. After getting through the required rocket and scientist, I grabbed the Helix Fossil to satiate you mad Helix lovers out there, and headed into Route 4. I taught both Mega Punch and Mega Kick to ground on before heading into Cerulean City, just shy of level 15. So we're getting close to Ancient Power, but not close enough since there's no way I'm fighting anyone in Misty's gym at this low of a level. So it's Rival 2 time. He leads with a Pidgeotto, no surprise there, but thanks to Rock Tomb, it's a two-shot, with him only landing a critical gust that doesn't even do half, even though it has three levels on us. Groudon hits level 15, so we replace Rock Tomb with Ancient Power. Ten more power and much more accuracy sounds like a great time to me. Squirtle's out second and hits a Water Gun before I annihilate it with Mega Kick and Mega Punch, leaving just Abra and Rattata to be destroyed to a Mega Kick and Mudshot each. Not bad at all, and since I'm stubborn and want to save time, I potioned up ground on between battles, since items are allowed outside of battle in the rules. Ah yes, the unsung rules that I never talk about anymore since I figure people know how rules in a self-imposed Pokemon challenge work. Maybe I should start adding those to the description, but I digress. Groudon jumped from level 15 to level 20 before I got the SS ticket from Bill, and with that I figured it's time to take on Misty. Drought should assist me through. 
First try doesn't go well, unfortunately, due to some missing and confusion shenanigans, but the second time goes a bit more smoothly. Staru is up first, going down to a single mega kick as Starmie follows it up. I miss, unfortunately, getting nailed with a water pulse for my troubles, but I'm able to follow up with Slash for almost half damage, having replaced Mega Punch for it, and another Mega Kick, connecting after another water pulse and winning me the badge with only 9 HP remaining. Phew, I thought I was going to have to fight the second gym leader three times in a row for a speedrun. I'd be Mega Kicking myself if I was doing that. With Starolian's stuff all said and done, I'm able to head towards Route 5 and into my next destination, but not before grabbing the TM for Dig from this random rocket grunt. Fortunately, this has a bit of a power boost compared to Mudshot, as well as an increase in accuracy in exchange for it taking an extra turn to connect. And while this isn't necessarily the best for a speedrun, it is nice for consistency. So I replace Mudshot, and I await Earthquake to replace it at level 35. Alright, time for Rival 3 over on the SSN. First attempt goes well as he leads with Pidgeotto, going down in one ancient power as I get the Omni Boost, going into War Turtle, critting with Mega Kick before even seeing an attack, leaving just Raticate and Cadaver to go down with one slash apiece. Jeez, I didn't expect the Omni Boost, but I think that following it up with a crit is quite the lucky event, so I'll absolutely take it. Before I made it on the ship, though, I had gotten the Farfetch trade and the Bike Voucher. So I'm able to teach Farfetch the HM for cut and make my way into the gym. Nothing too crazy, the puzzle never really gives me that much trouble, mostly because it's BS and I always save state past it. In casual runs, in these runs, I don't care, you're not making me do that stupid puzzle. I had trauma as a child doing it and I will never do it again. Okay, deep breaths. It's time to kick the crap out of a ball and some rats, you can do that, right? Good. So, Surge starts off with Voltorb, going down to Mega Kick, as does Pikachu. But I'm an idiot and didn't realize that Static can still work on ground types this generation. So I get Paralocked into Oblivion since I can't land a single slash, and Raichu just sets up double team for god knows how long. Fortunately, I am able to hit two slashes in a row later on in the battle just before getting KO'd, but I was willing to reset for having been an idiot and not have paid attention to how Static works but I didn't have to, so yippee. Third badge in hand, I headed back up to Route 6, grabbing the Hidden Rare Candy and moving over to Route 9, just east of Cerulean City. Since it's time for my favorite stretch of the game, where we obliterate all of the trainers and jump an insane amount of levels, and essentially make the game easy from here until Rival 6. Well, jumping from level 24 to 29 isn't insane, though it does put me on par for Erika and Celadon City. Does that mean I'll be fighting her yet? God, no. We actually have a rocket hideout and more money to take from Giovanni's pockets first. By this point, Groudon's level 30 and I got Bulk Up, essentially a physical calm mine that's going to boost all of my attacks for now, as Rock, Normal, and Ground are all physical in Generation 3. With that though, Giovanni's next in line as he starts with Onyx, trying his best to do any damage whatsoever, failing, and proceeding to get stomped with three digs after I had set up with two Bulk Ups. Sorry there, buddy. Better luck next time. Oh, I got flinched. Oh, he survived! Well, Ancient Power will seal the deal, and it does, winning me the battle and letting me move out of here with an escape rope, since I'm not fighting an additional trainer that I don't have to. Fly is my next target, since I need to go back to Lavender Town to take on the fourth rival fight and to clear out Team Rocket from the tower itself. So I went straight for both of those things, including ripping through my rival's team with Ancient Power on Pidgeotto, Dig and a Critical Slash on War Turtle, two slashes on Execute as he missed with Hypnosis, and another Ancient Power for Growlithe, sweeping the battle up like a little pile of dust. The one Channeler and three required Rocket Grunts were taken care of succinctly, getting me just shy of level 35. And my oh so dearly beloved Earthquake. So I decided to be an absolute moron and go straight into the stealth company with only three badges, and just after the tower event. Usually I leave this until I take care of both Erika and Koga's gyms, but hey, sometimes you gotta be crazy to win. I managed to get to level 35 before facing off against the fifth rival battle, getting Earthquake in the process, and basically finishing off my moveset for the time being. He leads with a fully evolved Pidgeot as I go for bulk up twice, doubling both of my physical stats as Groudon gets hit with two wing attacks, barely doing anything 
So I use Ancient Power and get the Omni Boost again, putting me to plus 3 attack and defense and plus 1 everything else. So he follows up with Blastoise going down to a single Earthquake after some protection shenanigans. And yeah, it's just a snowball from there, as Execute, Alakazam, and Growlithe all fall to a single Earthquake, winning me the fight in short order. At an underleveled point in time, so I'm kind of surprised I even got to this point without getting clapped over and over again. So I'm quite happy with myself. But let's see if I can say the same thing with Gio. Oh, I can't even finish that sentence. Like Giovanni's gonna be freaking hard. Oh uh, yeah, he leads with a Nidorino. Easy earthquake target and one shot. Good stuff. Leading to Kangaskhan. I had assumed I'd get faked out, which I did. So I started bulking up after that getting hit with a Tail Whip and Rage before getting two of them set up, hitting an Earthquake for the KO, and leading to Rhyhorn. Fourth it and Nitto Queek? I wrote Nitto Queek in the script, not Nitto Queen. Ah, uh, Nitto Queek. Uh, I love it. Both hit and Nitto Queek were one-shots at this point, finishing the fight in short order. God, I'm such an idiot. And since I actually remembered this time, I headed up to the 10th floor to grab that free rare candy that definitely helps later on in the run. Okay, Sabrina time. Yeah, I'm going out of order, but to be fair, I didn't even realize it when recording since I had literally not touched this run in a month. That's how busy I've been lately. But enough about real life. It's time to beat up a psychic wizard, whatever the heck this chick is. Kadabra's up first, setting up Reflect, but still going down to a single Earthquake, leading to Mr. Mime, who manages to live an Earthquake in the healing range, going for Barrier to increase her defense by two stages. After healing, she does it again as I kept using Bulk Up, and by the time Reflect wore off from Kadabra, she didn't even do any damage and I got a free KO with Earthquake, leaving just Venomoth to go down to Ancient Power, and Alakazam to Earthquake, giving me the Mind Badge. Completely out of order. Heck, I didn't even realize at this point that I had skipped Erica, so I just shotgunned my way over to the cycling road, picking up both the hidden power point up and max elixir before storming to Fuchsia City and bitch slapping Koga for not having lost already. I'm going fast, dude, get out of the way! He leads with coughing, so I went for bulk up, getting hit with by Toxic in the process. Okay, with Toxic, I am on a clock, but I think I can still pull off the win if I do this right. Slash is a one-shot on Coughing, as Earthquake is on Muck, so then, of course, Slash will be a one-shot on the second Coughing, leaving just Wheezing. It has Levitate, so Earthquake isn't gonna do it, and unfortunately Slash does less than half as he uses Smokescreen, bumping me down to 9 HP off of the Toxic damage. But I'm a lucky man in everything Pokémon, getting a critical Ancient Power and winning the battle in the perhaps closest fashion I could hope for. While I run through the Safari Zone, though, to grab my HMs, I should go on a diatribe after that. How is it that I can be so lucky in Pokemon games, getting criticals left and right like that, and every single time I roll dice to see who goes first at my Yu-Gi-Oh! locals, I get stomped? Seriously, I have lost all but two dice rolls, literally two, to see who goes first at my Yu-Gi-Oh! locals, and every time I use a coin, the, I got a metal Pokemon coin that I use from the new Zacian and Zamazenta Ultra Premium Collection box. I win. There's a clear discrepancy here, mostly because I get low rolls that have more than a 50% chance to lose. Uh, maybe I should try Rock, Paper, Scissors instead. With both of those off my chest, though, I grabbed both the HMs for Surf and Strength, only to realize that I can't push the boulder to get the rare candy. So my idiotic self thinks, oh, I have to go fight Blaine to unlock strength, still not yet realizing I haven't fought Erika yet, despite the fact that I had saved in front of Koga, and it said that I only had four badges. Dummy. You'd think I'd know how badge progression works, but apparently not. Either way, though, I headed down to the Cinnabar Island, ran through the Pokemon Mansion super quickly, with the exception of this trainer battle that I forgot existed because I never run into it, running through the trainers of Blaine's gym, and arriving at his battle at a crisp level 43. It took me a few tries, but at this level, I can indeed take him down. Growlithe's up first, going down to Earthquake, so does Ponyta, as does Rapidash, all at minus one attack, mind you, after Growlithe's Intimidate, but with Arcanine's Intimidate putting Growlithe onto minus two, Earthquake is no longer a one-shot, leaving him wide open to a sun-boosted Fire Blast and happens to get the burn as well, having my attack yet again. But fortunately, there was still enough juice left in the tank to make up for the rest of Arcanine's HP, 
taking him down and getting me the Volcano Badge. Alright, can we quit the close battles now? I'm getting a bit too tired from the excitement and anticipation all wrapped into one little package. I'm guessing you know the drill at this point, though. Go back to Fuchsia, check the boulder, realize I'm an imbecile for forgetting to get Erica's badge, and then go to that gym now that I realize it. I taught Groudon Aerial Ace in order to run through the entire gym, since I didn't really have a need for Slash anymore. I took out the trainers in there for the EXP and the money, of course, since I was close to level 45 and getting Fire Blast. But to be honest, I didn't even really need it. I just needed to stick with Aerial Ace since it ended up netting me one-shots on Erica's Victory Bell, Vileplume, and Tangela, winning me the fourth badge that happens to be my seventh. Gotta love Kanto progression. Can I get my damn rare candy now, please? Thank you! Ah, <sighs> there we go. I'll make sure that Groudon will consume it with the utmost of pleasure. Now, with nothing left to do other than to take on the Viridian City Gym, and instead of training on all the high-level opponents in the gym, I saw it wise just to take on the two required trainers and get to Giovanni in short order so that I could rip his Pokemon hearts out by quaking the ground, I guess. I'm just shy of the three-hour mark going into this fight, though, so that's unfortunate that I won't beat the Rayquaza time, but I will beat in Giovanni's face, and that's just as satisfying. Earthquaking, his Rhyhorn, Dugtrio, Nidoqueen, Nino King and second Rhyhorn, all with one shots, sweeping him without the need of bulk up. That's right, you're so bad of a Pokemon trainer that I don't even need to use stat boost to sweep you. You're just a terrible Pokemon trainer, and that's why you lost to a 10 year old. Bye! Enough ragging on Giovanni, though, it's time for Rival 6 and the run to get really spicy. So, the first attempt was terrible since I missed twice with Fire Blast, and reset since I'm not dealing with the stupidly bad RNG. Alright, attempt number two, and I went for bulk up once, taking two wing attacks as I KO'd with three aerial aces, mostly because the second one got a low roll, leading to Blastoise. Earthquake isn't quite a one-shot at plus one, allowing him to set up Rain Dance, extinguishing my Drought ability, but no matter, I don't need Fire Blast to take on the rest of this team. He goes down to a second Earthquake as Execute comes out third, eating an Aerial Ace for breakfast as Growlithe sits down to consume a hearty Earthquake for lunch. Rhyhorn's afternoon snack is also an Earthquake, while Alakazam enjoys a nice quiet evening by himself, consuming two Aerial Ace portions before heading to bed, winning me the fight. Who knew that describing a battle as consuming food would be more interesting? Beats saying the same thing for 20 times for 20 different runs of the same game. So, one last dumb mistake was made before facing off against the Elite Four, and that's running out of regular repels. I had max repels, don't get me wrong, I didn't run out of repels completely, but what I didn't realize was when I ran out of regular repels, the item right below it were escape ropes. So I used an escape rope to escape, like, right before the end of the dungeon, wasting time and making me kind of angry at myself for doing so. It was a dumb mistake, but hey, I think it was kind of funny. But I got to the Pokemon League and bought all of the necessary healing items, which were like, what, five full restores? I don't really need much. And went in. And immediately got my bum clapped because I didn't use my rate rare candies before going in. So I used those and gave Groudon both a Lumberry and of course those rare candies that I had collected thus far. And went in with only the TMs that I had in my bag, because I wasn't going out of the way for anything else. After a few attempts, though, Lorelai ended up becoming a piece of cake to me. She always tries to replace Drought with Hail, so I took advantage of that, using Bulk Up to take down Dugong with Earthquake, leading to Cloyster. This thing's an idiot and thinks I'm using more than one Pokemon, so she sets up Spikes and uses Protect. So I get two more free Bulk Ups, getting Groudon here to plus three attack and defense being enough to KO Cloyster, Slowbro, Jinx, and Lapras all with Earthquake, letting me by without much of a fight. Good stuff though, Lorelei's not usually the easiest in the world since most legendaries have a weakness to ice, as does Groudon, but manipulating the AI enough to make it think that a physical tank like Cloyster was the right move to go into second was probably the best thing I could have asked for. With that said though, it's time for Bruno, who's also a complete joke. I just set up a ton of bulk ups on his first Onyx as he tried to do a bit of damage to me, and sure, he did about 20% of my HP and lowered my speed, 
But with that, I was able to Earthquake his first two Onyxes, and Aerial Ace both his Hitmonchan and Hitmonlee for one-shots, leaving just Machamp to heal stall through a few Aerial Aces, hitting a wonderful cross chop that did a whopping 19 damage, allowing me to just slice it in half and move on. Not bad at all, I didn't expect Bruno would be hard at all, since I had super effective physical moves for all of his Pokémon, but let's see if Agatha will be any easier. I started with Earthquake because I'm a stupid idiot, but she started going for Double Team, and Aerial Ace can't miss, so I just went for a few bulk ups until she missed a Toxic, and so I realized we need to attack now. So I did, KOing and leading into Golbat. Aerial Ace whipped its bum into next week, though it finally consumed my Lumberry by hitting a Confuse Ray, going down straight after. Third out is Haunter, not getting to do much of anything before going down to an Aerial Ace and leading into Gengar number 2. This thing scared the heck out of me. It got me down to 5 HP after putting Ground on to sleep with Hypnosis, then using Nightmare to decrease its health by 25% after every turn that was it, it was asleep after. And sure enough, Ground on was asleep for 4 turns, only waking up when it was absolutely necessary taking it out with Aerial Ace and leaving just Arbok to get smashed with Earthquake, even through Intimidate, winning me the fight. Alright, first three down, last two to go, surprised that Agatha was a first try win, especially after all of that. But here's where it finally starts to get tricky. Gyarados is Lance's first Pokémon, a very threatening Pokémon to me since I'm using a ground type, as we exclaimed earlier in the video, it's water flying, meaning my stab earthquake can't connect. And he's got a super effective move. But the kicker here is that he won't use a water move, because Drought apparently is too much for him, and Dragon Rage and Bite will apparently do more. Which they don't, but hey, that's a great thing to learn on my first attempt, and on my very next attempt I managed to take him down. So Gyarados says Intimidate, not good, but I went straight for Bulk Up, using it three times as he used two Bites and a Dragon Rage. He went for another Dragon Rage as I used a fourth bulk up, but I had a Citrus Berry, healing 30 out of the 40 HP that I took damage from that as I went for a fifth bulk up. I had given Groudon both the Berry and the TM for return now that I'm done with Ghost types, giving me an extra 42 power for this battle since return maxes out at 102 with max happiness as opposed to Aerial Ace's static 60 base power. With that said, return was a one shot on Gyarados, leading to Aerodactyl. I went for return again after taking a wing attack, despite it resisting, but I got it down to the red, so I went for the 6 bulk up on the turn I knew he'd heal, using return after another wing attack, but it still wasn't enough. So I just used another one, tanking one more wing attack and leading to Dragonite. Fortunately, the rest of his team I just outspeed, so Dragonite's a one shot with return, as are his two Dragonairs winning me the fight and getting me to level 60 to learn Fissure! Yeah, absolutely not. Leave that spot removal to Yu-Gi-Oh! Like anyone plays Fissure anymore, anyway. Okay, so this champion battle, though. This champion battle was stupid. Literally freaking stupid. If I had kept Aerial Ace, this would have been mitigated, since I could have kept using Bulk Up through Pidgeot's stupid Feather Dances, but the fact that it also has Sand Attack at this stage of the game drove me nuts. I know I should have known that it had it, but... At the same time, I thought that return was going to be better for Lance. <sighs> Either way, it took me about a half hour of real time just for me to beat the battle, while the game was at 2 times speed and eventually I got to the point where I was using speed up between attempts just to get into battle quicker to give me more attempts, so I'd say add on another 10 minutes to the clock and it would have taken me an hour and 10 minutes if I had done it all in real time. But we're smart, we don't waste time around here. That is, of course, unless I'm being a moron and just not paying attention. But that only happens occasionally. I digress. Let's just talk about the winning attempt. I went for bulk up a ton on Pidgeot, getting hit with Feather Dance and Sand Attack like mad, but I decided, you know what, I'm just gonna see what happens, and sure enough, the time I decide that, I actually start sweeping after getting those bulk ups in. I hit the first attempted return on Pidgeot, leading to Blastoise, who goes down to Earthquake surprisingly, so I connected two attacks here. I think the biggest thing here though was hitting return after Executor missed Sleep Powder, despite the fact that I'm the one who literally got Sand Attacked like four times. 
Alakazam also goes down to an Earthquake after setting up Reflect, leading to his fifth Pokemon, Rhydon. And here's where I start to miss. I missed two Earthquakes, but fortunately my third connected, leaving just Arcanine. This thing is extremely scary under Drought, and since I am minus four accuracy, at least I think that's where we are, since Flamethrower did over half damage, I only have one attempt to connect with an attack. Unfortunately, I do hit a frame where my accuracy check was fine, and Earthquake landed, winning me the battle and the league with a time of 3 hours and 34 minutes. Yeah, I didn't expect it to take that long, but I can't say that Groudum was bad. Sure, I could have used TMs like Flamethrower or Thunderbolt, but quite frankly, I don't think I needed them. Bulk up strats carried me very far, and if I had kept Aerial Ace throughout the final two battles, I can probably guarantee you that it wouldn't have taken as long, though maybe wasting it in Erika's gym instead of using Return first was the dumb idea. Either way though, I would have needed Aerial Ace for Agatha, and then when I got to Lance I would have been SOL when it came to Aerodactyl and all of the immunities and resistances it had against my Groudon. But no matter, I came out on top and that's all I care about. Let's take a look at the leaderboard though, and yeah, that's about where I expected him. Box legendaries tend to be better than mythicals in the first three generations, so I'm not surprised that the two we've done so far in Rayquaza and Groudon are higher than Jirachi and Deoxys. With that said though, next time we take on a legendary speedrun, it'll be with Kyogre to finish off the Weather Trio. See you guys then! Thank you guys so much for watching this video, and for helping me reach 65,000 subscribers by the end of this year. Seriously, it was crazy to see us go from about 14,000 at the beginning of this year to over 50,000 new people coming in. Seriously, if you guys are new to this channel from the entirety of 2020, thank you. You guys have really helped me hit an insane milestone I never would have thought possible. I can only hope that we hit that 100,000 subscriber mark by the end of 2021, though. And if my plans for videos come to fruition, I'm not gonna lie, I wouldn't be shocked if we'd had 150,000. But don't hold me to it, since we all know what happens when I tell you guys plans for this channel. Last thing, if you haven't followed me over on Twitch, be sure to do so, link in the description. We are closing in on 2,000 followers over there, and I've been really enjoying streaming Professor Oak Challenge content over there for you guys, since we've been doing Black 2, White 2 over there recently, and we're actually in the postgame. But with all of my blah 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 out of the way, stay safe, stay healthy, and have a fantastic new year.